at the moment we are just like single intelligence units and there are maybe some AI intelligence separately, but, but when we connect this intelligence on a global scale and we, we learn how to better connect our brains together and th then it will be such an exponential growth of intelligence. <laughs> Nils Müller is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Nils' spectacular keynotes, pioneering journeys into the future, and always well ahead of our times, Nils is a future visionary and with over 700 keynotes on international stages, one of the most experienced and versatile inspiration speakers in the entire future industry. Always, you can join him on an expect, exceptional and interactive expedition into the future. His next stop is 2030. Mm -hmm. Niels is the CEO of Trend One, which he founded in 2002, has managed ever since as the market leader for trend research and innovation consulting in German speaking countries. Trend One defines today's standards for targeted future orientation in a rapidly developing world with a view on markets, industries, and societies. With the help of the global active network, La Futura, Niels Müller brings together leading futurists and visionaries at an international level, a global network. Niels sets enthralling standards for multimedia-based journeys into the future with active audience participation with his journey into the future and the brand new Creators Keynote. Welcome, Nils. It's so great to have you on the show. Whoa, I'm so happy to be here with you, Mark, today. <laughs> I'm so you glad you are. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's good to see you. And as always, you're bubbly and smiley. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, how have you been? How has this last little crazy pandemic time for you been? For me, it's really an exciting time because it's a massive push towards innovation. You know, all, all my clients now feel that they suddenly arrived in 2030. When you look at their workplace, at their leadership, at their spaces where they usually work, suddenly they are in 2030. You, you, in, in normal times, it would have take 10 years to come here, but now we arrived in 2030 and that's so great. So they they feel that they can innovate fast because they did. They feel that they must innovate faster because the whole world is accelerating. We have like a global shift towards innovation from Europe to China. China is really leading innovation now. They invest in so many interesting future fields. And yeah, they, 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 they feel they have to innovate and they see they can innovate faster. That is so exciting. And it's a good time for me. I also yeah, yeah, yeah. a good time for you. Huh? Yeah, it's a fabulous time for me. And, and you know, it's, it's sad and we have to respect the, the pandemic and, and the lives lost and what's happened. But it's really for what we've been talking about, you know, as a sustainable futurist and as a futurist, someone who follows trends and innovation. Um, We've been talking about these things for years. We've been working in the future, trying to innovate and make our offices, our, our home zoos, our, our lives into one that is pushing towards the future uh, of a better world. And so um, those who didn't heed our words or didn't listen in, in the past are really knocking down my door, I believe your door as well, saying, hey, we need some help. We'd, help us get them, make that curve. We didn't listen, let's get going. What do we need to do? And uh, it's been a real great time in that respect, uh, definitely. So I'm glad to hear that you weathered the pandemic pretty good and, and I figured nothing less. As someone who does a lot with trends and the future um, foresight, did that all prepare you for this moment in time um, so that you, weathered the pandemic pretty well or um can you tell us what what you've been doing in the past that really would you say wow that really prepared me for this moment in time that that it, it's affected me in a positive way than a worse way 
So we, we had in our trend universe, we published it every three years. We had global pandemic in 2007 in the trend universe. So this is, it was already clear that something like this will happen, but not exactly when and where, but now, now it's there. And I, I was really happy that my company is ready first to, to, to work remotely, to, to work collaboratively. We, we have all the tools ready and also um, that, that this new mindset helps us to, to innovate better and to also for us, I mean, it's not only at our client side, it's also at Trend One, we transform. Usually we do around 250 events per year, which is like future spaces, keynotes, all the stuff. And now in, in March, I was sitting at Frankfurt Airport and seeing all the Asian people wearing the masks and sitting there and saying, what a crazy time. And a friend from Switzerland called me and said, Niels, we have to, have to set up a virtual cloud-based event engine where thousands of people can, this is the right thing now. And I said, okay, let's do it. So we started to build up virtual event platforms in March. And now we have a stage city called, and stage city is a virtual event environment where 5,000 people can meet, enjoy keynotes, networking, interaction, keynotes, exhibitions. So I'm also happy that we had the power internally to transform. So we walked the talks. We, 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 we transformed our business model from real world to virtual world. The same we do in our consulting unit where we do like physical workshops every day. Now we do all this online workshop and other people learn from us. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a good time for, for future and innovation and also for sustainability, I think, because a lot of things happening now are really playing into sustainability and also changing the mindset of the future future leaders and consumers all goes in direction of clean, green, safe, and fair. I think these are the four components which really shape the consumer and leadership and, and employee mind, mindset at the moment. There's, there's a lot of acronyms and buzzwords out there and, and you know, sustainability has been the discussion for years. It's, it's really environmental, social governance. It's these different type of business models that really future-proof your companies, your organizations, so that during hard times that not only can they sustain themselves over time, but also so that they have this really resiliency in, in their models. Um, with, with innovations we and, and future we talk a lot about these moonshots and these innovations, you know, that could take us to space. That's the, the term of, uh, of this moonshot thinking, this uh, moonshot type of big, hairy, audacious goals and sustainable innovations. The thought behind that is really how can we uh, go to space uh, or to the moon and come back safely, you know, breathe, eat, work, and... Um, live in space safely and, and efficiently and return back home safely. And so this moonshot thinking has what a lot of people don't really know, a lot of resilience in it. So how do you use energy as efficiently as possible? How do you store your food and your energy so that you can survive and make that round trip without dying, killing yourself? How do you pee in your spacesuit? And that type of a model is also very applicable here on this earth with future technologies and future thinking. It builds a, a resiliency into your business model. And during this pandemic time, we've seen that ESG indexes and investments and divestments have all outperformed their conventional counterparts as far as better business models, better investments and better returns on your business. One other thing that, that I want to see if, if you've experienced as well, the, the leaders, the, the futurists, the, those who are already running on these models for a while, they were all uh, coming back to me saying they were put in a unique position to be able to help others who weren't prepared. They were be able to deliver food. They were be able to deliver digital services to help them um, get their company offline to online, how they could do the social distancing and set up, you know, uh, home offices. And, and it's kind of a different model. Did you have any good stories or experiences during that time where, you know, client or somebody called you up and said, Hey, yeah, we, we, we can help you with this or, or, 
um, that, that kind of shows that the model is one that really works. I, I love the moonshot shot, shot metaphor because I think this is so important for Europe. Also, we have this moonshot for Europe. Yeah. And this, this is so important because especially in Germany and Switzerland and Austria, we are, we are so stuck in this R&D engineering world where we make the world a little bit better every day, like increasing with, with engineering skills. But moonshot thinking goes beyond this, goes like on a new level of innovation, on a new horizon of innovation. It helps people to imagine the future in 2030 and 2040 when you live in space, for example, and you have to grow your food and you have to be careful with your energy and all this is disruptive thinking on horizon three. And of course, you need this engineering skills on on the level one, on horizon one, to make it a little bit better. But also you need to imagine as a company what could be future markets, future technologies relevant to my company. And this is this is super important for Europe at the moment to, to really go this step because a, a lot of these moonshot projects are running in, in the US and in, in China and maybe also in, in South Korea. But I, I think we, we have to stop just relying on our R&D and, and F&A. We have to start thinking in more in moonshots. But sadly, at the moment, this is not happening because due to Corona, the companies, the corporates more focus on cash flow, more focus on the, the relevant innovation now to digitalize uh, the workforce, to digitalize the customer journey. So this is, this is the homework of the last 20 years. They, some of them didn't do probably, and uh, they, they have to do it now. So a lot of, lot of corporates are at the moment really stuck on innovation horizon one to, 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 to deal with the situation and they don't have the resources and the brains and the freedom now to think about moonshots. That's, that's, a, that's a bit sad. Uh, this is especially in Europe and um, in, in the US, it's very good that they have the power to connect science to business. Yeah? They, they really have new scientific approach it like quantum computing, 5G, AI, and, and they, they, they have the power to put this to business also with the connection between science and business and with, with a lot of money they put into. And in, in China, this is the same with the big roadmaps of the government. The, the government has this long-term five-year plans and they have 5G in there and AI and sustainability, and, and they are prepared for moonshots and horizon three and uh, i'm a bit worried about about germany and europe that we that we that's not so easy for us to go the step yeah i i have to agree with you there i was hoping that you could maybe tell us maybe some some more positive stories where companies were, would really were ready or took a tool or trick of your trends or your preparedness to help them make that transition or that they weathered this time better to to be able to help others whether you have that or not i don't i don't want to put you on the spot but w w exactly on, on what you said i want to uh, uh, touch on something on that so um foresight modeling um talking about the future about moonshots and about this uh, moonshots for europe and you mentioned the the third horizon and that a lot of people are, are not aware of that, especially in the business world. You know, we're, we're thinking about the future. We're thinking about the trends and the innovation. Uh, I especially about sustainable innovations that have that built-in resilience in them. And there's these three horizons. And um, you can even say there are almost different dimensions um, uh, of, of attainment that everyone really needs to go through to be, or be able to reach that. Uh, and there's different curves, you know, there's the S curve, the Gaussian curve, the diffusion of innovation processes that that journey takes you in those three phases as you are trying to get your company into the future. Those processes really began years ago when we started to talk about the digital revolution that we needed to, to make that transition. And a lot of 
a lot of companies and organizations have been giving it lip service and not putting a lot of actions in that transitional phase, which, which really needs to happen. But I wanna give you some examples that maybe we can discuss as well of some companies during the pandemic that had implemented some procedures in, way before the pandemic, and they were on this roadmap towards the future already. Mm -hmm. um, and they were working a plan. And, and, and just to be clear for all our listeners, that roadmap is not an incremental uh, roadmap. It is an exponential roadmap. There is through KPIs, through uh, knowledge performance indicators, those are past performance indicators. You will never get over 10% incremental growth, no matter how far out in the future you push it. And that's not a moonshot. And that's not innovating and taking not only the risk, but the, the risk towards attaining the future of a resilient, secure business model that will lead that lead your company well into the future. Um, and those companies are, are te uh, Tesla, Amazon, um, many of the other affiliated companies of Tesla. Um, during the pandemic, during, during the lockdown phase, Tesla, um, SolarCity, uh, Neural Netlink, uh, Starlink Broadband, and all of the other companies uh, of Elon Musk, they continued to meet all their deadlines because that was also the window of launch dates in the United States, the, the, the window for, for launch goals because other times of the year aren't that ideal for launching rockets out in, into space because of temperature and conditions and, and, and all sorts of other factors, which may change in, in the future. But all of those dates were achieved. So we went from going toward, from the old Apollo to the, the, uh, the space shuttle mission instrumentation to a new Dragon Falcon rocket that took two crew members to the ISS space station that went from a 12 button, three touch display panel, totally flipping the entire space industry on its head, not only by having rockets return, but on how automated and how futuristic their panel was. That movement into digitization and into the future what was, uh, was really there. Plus they met the goals and the standards of rock launching the rockets and satellites and, and doing all the tests, launching the new um, cyber truck, the other, the other vehicles um, that they're launching and doing all these milestones. Plus they pivoted on a dime and were able to build respirators and help people in need during that time. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't a commercial for Tesla. Uh, and that, that's not, that's not my, my thought or purpose uh, because there's a lot of controversy as well about their, free, uh, I believe it was a Fremont plant not shutting down or opening too soon before the, all the measures were in place. But that is a company and an organization that has been working on the future. Amazon wasn't locked down during the pandemic. They were delivering essentials there was one delivery driver handing a package with a mask and, 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 and gloves on or, or whatever, handing it over to one person. And in the, the center where they packaged those, it was either fully automated or it was social distance to pack up boxes. And that process continued to churn to give us what we needed. And so those companies that didn't make that transition and are waiting for the future to happen to them uh, are closing their doors, they're laying off people, they're realizing how are we gonna get our employees up to speed from working at home and so on, on. And I really kind of bring that up because I wanna see if you've noticed that as well, that those companies that implemented those plans years ago are sitting in a better place and if you've had new customers or old customers knocking on your door saying, boy, we really need to get on the ball. Can you help us to get there? Uh, do you have any stories like that? I think there come two, two components. What you're, what you're explaining with Tesla is a great example of visionary leadership. So there's a, there's a person with a purpose, with a vision, with a big picture, 
and, and the power to do it. And this is visionary leadership. This comes from the top. And there are so many people who like to follow because, and they like to work for, for this purpose and for this vision. And this is visionary leadership. And I, I, I really miss this in, in, in Germany, in, in many big corporates where I say, where is this visionary leadership? Where is this future readiness? Where is this future anticipation and this hunger for future? And also the purpose of Tesla is in, in big fields is decarbonization. It's just decarbonization. And this is everything they do. It's, it's related to decarbonization. And this is maybe the, the most important goal of all. And uh, this, this is such a big thing and such a great story you are telling. And I also don't want to advertise on Tesla, same, but, but it's such a good story to explain visionary leadership and having, having a purpose and to, to get all people in on this purpose. And I'm, I'm, I'm missing this in, uh, in a lot of big German, German corporates. They are, they, are, they are also doing good things, but it's all more incremental. And usually in German, we, Germany, we were the, the society of the inventors. When you, when you look at the top 100 inventions on the world in the last 100 years, I think a lot of them came from Germany, but we, we invented like solar and MP3 and atom and everything, but maybe somehow we lost the way to bring it to the market. And I think the American companies are, are great in, in customer experience. Also, the Chinese companies are so good in customer experience and, and delivering this innovation, this invention as successful business models into the market. And, and this, is, this is what I like in the story. And I, I see a, a lot of my clients doing great things in circular economy and huge chemical companies in, reinventing themselves because when they come circular, they... They are not just the supplier of additives and plastics. They are, they are the platform of running circular business models. So they also start there and it's also good for sustainability, but maybe the pictures and the visions are not so strong. And I, I would like to do an assessment on the, on the top boards of the 30 DAX companies, how future ready are they? And it's not only about future readiness of the organization. This is, this is one story, but the future readiness of the top management. This would be an exciting assessment. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really surprised because I've gotten an insight into several organizations uh, just during this pan, pandemic. I work with a lot of Fortune 1000 companies, um, tons of Fortune 1000 companies and advise them and consult them mainly on environmental social governance, trying to restructure their business model to not only have sustainable innovation in it and this kind of future um, proof business model so that they can have the resilience so that they can have the efficiencies and the return on investment long-term. But, um, and, and they're honestly, they're actually pretty front running organizations. So, I, w I work with about 21 different airline organizations that are all working on the future of flight. And the future of flight, I can promise you, will be here no later than 2026 in, in a way that is unimaginable for most people. It's, it's similar to like if you were to ask me 10 years ago, will there be autonomous vehicles on the Audubon or on the highway? I, I, I don't think I could have really truly understood or imagined how quickly that would come and, and even ride in one of those vehicles and, and, and not have to really truly watch the road. Um, in that same respect, we've are, are also got these five passenger taxis, Uber and Hyundai and Ilium Jet and, and many others, uh, as, as well as KLM and, and um, Airbus and Boeing working on some larger commercial units batteries are coming down in size. There's new hydrogen jet fuels out there. So um, uh, another big message I have for, for clients and, and those is that please don't wait for the future to come to you because it will be too late. You'll be left in the dust. Um, meet the future and prepare for it by, by uh, revamping your business models and preparing for um, a brighter, resilient, desirable future. 
the, this big, the big, a big issue that we have is a lot of people really are, are waiting for the future to act upon them, waiting for them, uh, for it to occur to them. Um, but that, that's a, that's a failing model and it's one that's not very sustainable and you're, you're more reactionary and it's not a proactive type of, type of approach. In, in a reactionary approach, if we get a pandemic, then we uh, uh, do social distancing measures. We have face masks. We tell our employees that, you know, will 50% of them have to work from home and the other 50 from the office, or we say 100% and, and we come up with these new things, but they're all reactionary models not getting us, um, we don't want to get back to business as usual, but what we want to do is we want to work in the future that we've been talking about for years. So a good friend of mine, Tim Leberecht, wrote the book, Business Romantic. Uh, I have a good a friend, uh, Frederick Lalou. He wrote the book, Reinventing Organizations and um, also Holacracy. I have, I have a lot of people in, in my circles who are talking about the future of business and what it will look like and what we need to do to get there. But there's a lot less actions being taken by organizations to make sure that we can be prepared and get there. And, and what that, what that causes and creates is this, this reactionary model. So then when a pandemic happens, we react and, and try to put these measures in place but there's no prevention for the next time because there will be next times. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is, is these business models and kind of the discussions of the trends that we talk about uh, with our employees and that you've been talking about for years. Um, what would you say for 2020, regardless of the pandemic is the biggest trend or um, aha innovation or, foresight that you have that that needs to be implemented that will have the biggest return on investment for organizations to get them into that next horizon that we're talking about first you, you said it's it's good to really if you are like a proactive leader and if you proactively create the future and not wait for the future and i i, I want to agree on this and I think you need two things. Maybe one is, is the mindset. And sometimes you have a lucky punch like a leader uh, from Tesla and uh, Elon and he's, he's, he just has this mindset and he's just in his DNA too. But, but you also need future education because it's, it's like running a business. You need some kind of education and foresight. What we do at Trend One and innovation consulting, this is kind of, you should be educated in to anticipate the future to understand the trends, to build positive and, and, and pictures of the future and visions and working, working with trends and building visions and imagining the future and playing with this future and finding future fields in these visions. This is the, the thing you can learn. And we, we are using trends to build this picture of the future, to build future scenarios and to imagine how will the world be in 2030? How will the world be in 2040? And what are our business chances there? And what are the innovation fields there? And, and then you can start a backcasting and say, okay, what fr from this vision, what can we do now to, and also using our company assets, what we have and skills and resources and capabilities to be successful in this future? And maybe what do we have to, build up new and what partnerships do we need to to be successful in this future and this can be educated but the leaders of today don't have this education they 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 learned mba and and phd and and, and statistics and uh, accounting and they had all this in the university but foresight to anticipate the future working with trends building scenarios this is the, the universities don't educate this so much, especially in the past. Now maybe it's starting a little bit. There are some professors on, on foresight, like Professor Nervini Robeck or Professor Heiko von der Gracht or some in, in the US and uh, some in, in Brazil and uh, in Lisbon. And, but there, there are not so many. And I think more people should be educated 
in anticipating and working and creating futures. Um, and also kids, of course, in, in the school, in the university, because it's so important because the future is faster than you think. We now feel it. The future comes sometimes super fast, changing your business model within three or five years. And, and you, as a leader and also as a manager, you need this ability to anticipate and, and create the future. And this is what, what, what makes it possible, what you said, to, to be a proactive leader and not just wait and react, but, but create. But, but you were asking for, for, for the overall trend now during the pandemic. And I, I think and that's good news for you. Um, we call it planet centricity. We, we've seen that a, a lot of companies are now dealing in their innovation, R&D and future business models with a planet as a central stakeholder on the table. So in, in former times, they were just thinking about profit or about people or about users. But now when they, when they create something new in their brains or in their workshops or in their management meetings, it's like the feeling the planet is sitting on the table as a stakeholder with his planetary needs and his planetary benefits and his planetary wishes. And this, this, this is the big change and the meta trend now we call planet-centric innovation where everywhere you're looking on innovation projects, planet plays a big role. And every corporate strategy you are now looking, when you, when you t look at Adidas, Audi, and you go the whole DAX, yeah? you look to the strategy papers of the companies or to the corporate reports, sustainability is on number one, or it's on number two, but it's somewhere there. This was not true five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago was sustainability was CSR department somewhere, yeah. somewhere it happened, let the others do uh, greenwashing. <laughs> but, but now it's really on number one. And, and, and this is now true in 2020, planet-centric innovation is the key meta trend. And I think this will go even further. We will create new companies that are only doing good for the planet. And these are not, not NGOs, something. This is something like Climeworks, you know, Climeworks from Switzerland. Yeah. They do carbon dioxide removal. So they filter the carbon out of the air. And because we need negative carbon, because we have too much carbon, and this is a company with an innovation and a business model just for the planet. They don't build cars or machines. They just innovate for the planet. And we will see more of this companies. You, you remember when, when Facebook was growing, when Amazon was growing, when WhatsApp was growing, all these leaders were laughing at them. Ah, they don't make profit. They just, they just, they don't make profit. Yeah, that's true. They, they didn't make profit. They was just caring about the user. And now we have companies, they don't make profit. They don't care about the people and, and, and about the, the users. They just care about the planet. That's their only, their only stakeholder. And this, this is so amazing. And that's the time now. It's, in, it's a born of a new industry just focusing on the planet. This is 2020. That's fabulous. Um, one, one thing I want to kind of go back in, uh, and unpack a little bit more. Trend One has thousands of trend scouts, or you have trend scouts that are actually working for you all around the world, and then you have a, a form of a system that goes out and, and, and finds those trends. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is happening since 2003. We were starting with a global trend scouting network and writing trend reports every month, publishing these reports to our companies. And we have, since 2003, we were always working cross industry and globally. So we were never a consultancy just for one industry. There are many just doing retail innovation or car innovation or automotive. No, we were always cross industry and always global because innovation, you, you know this, it already happened just somewhere else. Yeah? And that's it, exactly. So we, we have to look to Canada to find the newest carbon dioxide removal technology. You have to look to Taiwan to find the latest face detection technology. You have to look to Australia to find the newest trends in, in quantum computing, maybe. And that's true. So you, you need, we need this global scale of trend research. And we, were all, we are always very picky on this to say, really, cover China, cover Southeast Asia. And this is the permanent process so it's getting better and better the trend scouts send us the trends we pay them for the trends if it's a good trend and we take the trend and so it's a self-learning system uh, always getting better also with the internal 
trend research team and trend analyst team. And so we publish 250 trends per month, 250 per month on a global scale across industry since 2003. So now there's a database, Trend Explorer. Uh, so because we don't sell PDF anymore, we sell a, a trend database, uh, a subscription database. And this has more than 44,000 micro trends. Uh, daily new trends, and you can search for your trends in your industry, uh, new just business models, just technologies, just, just startups, on, uh, just regional focus. So this is a great, like a Google for trends uh, in future. That's and nice. we, yeah, that's, that's really good inspiration. I also use it like every day when I build my presentations, I just say, okay, what is the topic of the presentation? Maybe food, sustainable food supply chain, and I just enter there filter sustainability, food supply chain, suck, and I get all the trends. So this is really uh, an easy to use tool to, to create and anticipate the future. That's nice. I mean, I, I really like that. And I, I wanted to unpack that for our listeners, but then also touch upon, so now you've got the trends and then you, you also mentioned backcasting and I want to, I, I, I'm, my listeners are very intelligent, but I also want to unpack that for them. So you 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 find the trend you also uh, there's a date and time in the future that that trend will will peak will emerge will be there and then from that vision of the future whether it's movie magic or a innovation that will come by that time um, then you do what's called backcasting you take the backcast from from let's say it's december 2030 which is similar to the sustainable development goals. And you backcast from that point in time to present, to, to your point in time now. And with that backcast, you get the, the monies, the data, the goals, the, the actions that need to be done in order to achieve that by that date. You have all the data you need, all the, the wherewithal, market population, resources, size, monies, everything that are needed to achieve that by by that date and time, and therefore it can be worked towards. It's like a plan, it's a goal. And you know that I'm an advocate for the sustainable development goals and they function very similar how they were developed, not only with goals, but targets and indicators in the hundreds and that they were also formed through a date and time, backcasting and using dynamic systems modeling to achieve that. Um, so I, I really like that you not only use the foresight, but also the other tools that have been around for a long time in our industry uh, for science and math to actually help us achieve those innovations. And that's, even though I didn't come right out and say it, and we tickled the surface with what I was mentioning with Elon, and, and also if we look at any other innovators in the past, they just didn't start to do the rocket launch yesterday. They've been, they had a back cast, they had a vision, a goal, a plan, and then they've been working towards that relentlessly nonstop. And over time, that growth, that trend starts to grow exponentially and those timelines and deadlines start to be achieved and um, almost a critical mass to, to, to reach that future that we want. So that, there are some u unique things that you've kind of said there, but I don't even think that just the lay executive would say, I understand that, or I, I understand what they're talking about, and wow, I need to apply that to my business. And that's where you said, we need to educate them. Yeah. And so that, that's really what you do, not only with the trend reporting, but you go out and advise and, and have this education process as well. This, this is our consulting unit. It's, it's really working on the projects with the clients to use trends, to anticipate the future, to create pictures of the future, like scenarios, to find innovation fields, to do backcasting and pathways towards this innovation fields. And this whole discipline, you can call front end of innovation and front end of strategy, because this comes before corporate strategy. This comes before innovation. Because when you innovate, you should know where to innovate. And the front end of innovation and foresight helps you to anticipate the future fields you want to 
innovate in and to understand them and to evaluate them in terms of readiness, timelines, business models, benefits. You, you, can, you can work with these future fields as future business models. And then, you, then the strategy starts. Then you can say, okay, now we have a strategy department and we can build concrete strategies how to achieve this future. And then the innovation starts where you can say, okay, now we put design thinking and agile scrum methods to, to work towards the future, to deliver projects paying to this future. But before this is the front end of innovation. And ma many companies forget this. They say innovation is ideation. If you Google innovation process, you can, do, you can try it now. There are 20 pictures from, from science books that explain that the innovation process starts with ideating. But this is stupid. I mean, where should we ideate on? And you, if, you, if you ever did ideation workshops, you know you, you, you have a great time, you have so many great ideas, and you love this culture of ideation, but then it, 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 it somewhere ha it, it ends in your file server and nothing happens because this these ideas does not do not pay into like a, a a big picture and to a big innovation fields which also are in line with corporate strategy with a c level with the innovation department so the front end of innovation also helps to align the teams to say okay we get the top 20 stakeholder or sometimes uh, in switzerland we had a, a workshop with 500 stakeholders from one company so let it's take the top 500 people and try to anticipate the future for their business models and try to find relevant innovation fields. And this helps them to align and agree on specific futures they want to achieve. And this is the front end of innovation. And th there should be no strategy and no ideation or innovation agile design thinking project without doing this before. The future is, is uh, so complex, it's uh, made up of so many systems and we really need to understand it, um, how it works and that education is so vital. It really ties nicely because honestly, we haven't even really gotten into the first question that I wanted to ask you today, but it was a nice lead in to where we wanna go. And that lead in is, do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a future where there were no borders, walls, nations, or divisions of humankind in any respect? First, I want to answer your, what you said, that the future is so complex because it's such a complex system. And sometimes it's so easy. I, I, I like this discussion about carbon and uh, decarbonization because when we, when we think about the most important future fields i think first is decarbonization is, is one super important so just build business build innovation build technology for decarbonization that's this is not complex it's, it's all clear in science we have all the ipcc reports we have all its scientific proof we have we need decarbonization this this is the aim and we do and also for resources, we had a lot of discussions that uh, we need to save resources and sustainability is just possible when we save water and resources. And, and ethics is not a, a resource problem we have. It's a, it's a problem of our technology we are using. Because when, when you think about the paper industry, like when, when we both grow, where, where have you grown up? In, in UK or? No, between the United States and Allgäu, Germany. So southern Germany. And how, how was um, paper recycling when we, you were growing up there? You, you were reading newspapers and what did you do then? It, 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 back, back that I can remember, it was almost non-existent. We used it to, to burn in the fire, fireplace a lot of the time. And, and sometimes um, as kids, we'd use it as a project. So we'd take old newspapers and use it as some kind of a paper mache or school project in one way or the other to... Um, we also used it to, to, to um, I grew up on, on a uh, farm, so we also used it for other uses every day. And that what we could use, but yeah. Upcy upcycling. Upcycling, yeah. <laughs> I want to see your artworks when you work it. <laughs> uh, but paper is a good example. In Germany, you have a paper recycling uh, of 95%. So you, in, in the end, when, when you close the loop, 
you can consume as much as, as you want without go, giving pain to the planet because paper just it, it just can circulate faster and then you can have as much newspapers packages books as ever you want when it's a closed loop then we don't have a resource problem we, we need to invent technologies on, on plastic recycling and all this to close the loop and then it's uh, so, so i think this is the second big picture beside decarbonization is to close the loop and circular economy and then we can have endless consumption imagine you can have endless consumption on, on, on paper products plastic products electronic products because the loop is 100 percent closed yeah it's a circular economy we're thinking one planet living we're realizing that there is no throw away and how do we use everything efficient it's actually a, a, the same model as moonshot thinking so how do you uh, you not waste resources, energy when you're in the the cold depths of space, you know. So you you have to conserve and and try to reuse that. But that's the same thinking here on this planet. So that's absolutely vital. Um, now I'm going to hold you to the fire to answer the global citizen question. Yes, and I, I was thinking about this when I talked uh, about circular and and decarbonization. Maybe the same experience when you, when you travel, you, you, you connect with, with the world. And I, I think in, in, my, in my life journey, I, I, we both travel so much and we, we've seen all continents and meeting all the people and having so many friends. And for, for me, I, I really feel home everywhere. Of course, I have my home in Blankenese where I live with my kids and my wife and these are my roots and I'm happy to have this. But I, when, when I'm in Miami or when I'm in New York, I feel home and I love the people and I'm, I'm so open to all these cultures. And for me, it's so, such a benefit to meet all this international. I, I feel so much better when I have international people around me and different cultures and a lot of diversity around me makes me happy. And I'm, I'm totally feeling bad when... I go to an Elternabend or something and there's only less like 50 year old people. And this is also about the management board. When I, when I look at the ducks company and there's a management board and there are only 60 year old men sitting with bellies like this. And this is true. This is really true. Sometimes, sometimes I have presentations in engineering summits and I look to the audience and the 200 people with blue shirts and bellies and all are men and all are 60s. And, or between 50 and 60, I think this, then I don't feel comfortable. I feel comfortable when I have diversity, international cultures, everything, transgender, everything around me. And then I feel this is a good time. I, I want to stay here. I want to be part of this human experience experiment. Yes. And so I, I, I'm, I'm totally a global citizen. But I also think that sometimes it's good to have this regional differences. I like to travel to Switzerland and to have this Swiss culture. And you know what I mean, and b b this is also so nice, so I don't want maybe the borders to disappear. Of course, we should all be free and travel and, and working together, but it's also nice to have this regional cultures of Switzerland and Austria and, and Denmark and the Nordics are so nice people, and then you go to Italy and it's a total other world, it's also so nice, so I like this regional cultural differences, yeah. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that you, you feel like a global citizen and you like that diversity. I believe it's important as well. I, I believe that um, cultures and, and, and those experiences are very much needed in our world so that, that we have that diversity and that, that in some respects, those don't go away, but that there should be a form of much higher global standard as global citizens uh, that, that can give us a better, more innovative or more secure operating system for humanity as a whole. Um, there's, there's a topic that's coming up uh, fairly soon here in November, the US election. Mm -hmm. um, there are far reaching consequences depending on how that election goes for us all over the world. Uh, just as there were with Brexit, just as there were when Bolsonaro was elected, 
for our planet with resources, with things that occur, whether it's a pandemic in a lockdown or whether they occur just in normal trade or economic negotiations of a nation that affect us all over the world. And so we have uh, the Bolsonaro's of our world making decisions for us in Germany by letting the Amazon rainforest burn. And so me as a global citizen, I say, hey, I'm breathing that same air. That's creating carbon emissions. And it's also ruining um, my life here in Germany, the way I live it and our future effects of our future and our kids. Um, I want to have a decision in that governance for Brazil. I want to have a decision in that governance for the United States because they're making decisions and and, and things that affect us all on this same planet. Because you talk about circular economy, you talk about, you know, uh, you've talked about food and innovations. Those are all things that are borderless. They don't have borders. They're not nationalistic things. They're for everyone. Um, and energy, especially, that's not divided by borders. And so um, I just really wanted to know what your thoughts and feelings are moving in that direction and how that influences foresight, our future innovation and, and your thinking for my, my next question um, that I'll give you is probably the first and hardest one that I will give you today. Um, but I just want, you know, I don't know if you have something to say for that, but I, I, that's kind of why I caveated that about the global citizen. You, you know why I think we should all travel to space? Why? Because of the overview effect. You know, this overview effect when you, when you sit there and look on this planet and, and you see how, how fragile it is and this blue sky is just like a, a very, very thin thing and you see there are no borders and it's all in one and it's you have to protect us and you, you if you have this overview effect you get this feeling of we we need to protect it and this is maybe the biggest benefit so far space travel gave us to to have this overview effect and i think everybody should have everybody should travel to space eight billion people how can we do it maybe with virtual reality maybe we can build a virtual reality elevator that's so easy yeah and you just set it up and you, you go to space and you, you have this amazing overview effect. And every, every astro there's a book on the overview effect. You should, yeah, you should I have it. It's right here on my shelf. This blue one. Huh? And every astronaut ever, I, I met this, this guy who was like 500 days in space in, in Dubai. And every astronaut ever experiences it. Yeah, it's there. so uh, only about 500 people that have ever experienced it yeah. a, a real one, and they've all had a profound change in their life. Yeah. That, that really leads me to my first uh, most difficult question. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the future? Yeah, and, and you can answer that. I prefer you answer it for yourself. But if you want to answer that in the guise of the rest of the world, that's fine as well. Can I just say one word? Sure. Intelligence. That's that, the future. That's profound. And can it, we leave it? Yeah, we can leave it because that is um, so important. Um, with other things that you said about education and that intelligence is really a, a major player. We just lost Sir Ken Robinson, uh, um, August, I think it was August 21st or August 22nd, um, which was a big shift in our education in our world and, and a push for mm. reforming and changing how, how we uh, educate uh, everyone globally. Um, but I think that intelligence goes a lot as well by that as we have those moments of awe and experience and, and learn and, and are educated and have that intelligence, that next level. Uh, so it's really, really a profound thing. Thank you for that. So that, that makes my job much easier. The, um, I, I have some questions that I really want some 
kind of sustainable takeaways um, for my audience that that they can, they hopefully you will share with them and that they can get from you. Um, if you were to speak to some young innovators in your field of thinking um, that are looking for a way to make a real impact, what kind of empowerment or advice would you give them? Find a good mentor and a good good coach to to support you and stay long on your vision. In German, hartnäckigkeit. Yeah? yeah, persistence, dedication. Really, um, don't stop after just a couple of years. So you have to, you have to continue many years. It's a, it's a long journey, and it will be fruitful. But it, you, you have to continue really, really long and work, work hard on this. Work hard. It's like you do everything for this, and uh, really put all your energy there and find partners uh, find good find good partners because i think we all have special skills i mean you, you are special i am special and maybe i'm a more creative person and but you also need like analytical capabilities and financial capabilities and find that what, what mark, mark zuckerberg once said and usually i don't like facebook but i like this he, he said uh, my my best what I did is to find people in, in, in for, for jobs at Facebook in fields where I'm not good in. And I think that's also for, for an entrepreneur, if you want to create something, you, you need to see where you are good in and to find people to, 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 to match the gaps. To, to I really believe that, it, that is a key to success. So I, uh, that, that theme or that mantra has been around for a long time. So Henry Ford also, he, he, he didn't know everything about building uh, production facilities or uh, automotives, but he knew who, who, what engineers to find and those scientists and those people who were smart enough who had the answers, even if he didn't. I mean, he didn't even graduate from, from high school, and so there was a lot of controversy about that. But I uh, recently interviewed uh, John P. Strelecki. Uh, he writes, um, he sells a book in Germany about every 23, 26 minutes. He's sold well over 5 million copies of, of his books and he's done the Y Cafe and the Big Five for Life. And he says, you know, find the who. Find the person who has already done it, who is doing it. And, and like you said, you know, have them be your mentor those who have done it and who have been through them, watch and follow them, copy them, have them be your mentor. Um, so I'm right in the line. It's time after time, our, 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 our history has really shown that that's a, a, a super successful proven model. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey up until this point that you would have liked to know from the start. So back when you started, you know, what, 20 years ago or, you know, what, well long ago, um, what would you have liked to know back then that you, that you know now that you didn't know then that when it might've made your journey or, or travels a little bit easier? Now I know it's, it's so fantastic and inspirational to work in, in future and innovation and 20 years ago, I, I, did, I didn't had a glue on th that it's such an inspiring work I, I can do in, in the future. So maybe this, yeah, I know it now, it's, it's, it's fine, but uh, it, it was a hard, hard work and uh, I, I always loved it. And uh, I always loved, I also love to take the risk because I, I know what for I do it because risk is, Nothing you do just for fun or for adrenaline. It's just when you have a vision and when you, when you believe in something, you can take risks. And um, yeah, that's also what I like, to, 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 to take the risk to do the next step. That's fabulous. Um, what two or three actions can you give my listeners uh, uh, as advice or, or as citizens and decision makers that can help them accelerate the impact that they have in their chosen path. That um, if they're an activist or they're an innovator, if they want to be a futurist, or if they just are 
a business executive that wants to ensure that the company that they're working for is around in the future, what kind of two or three actions or decisions or, or things you can give them as a takeaway that would help them to accelerate their journey? Because uh, as we've talked from the beginning, uh, we kind of need to step up our game. The future is coming very fast and things are happening exponential and, and we can't do in incremental anymore. So do you have any advice or anything that you could offer them? I think it's very, very important already in these times because we are, we are working so much every day. We have all this Zoom calls and emails and we are in multitasking mode and we, we are losing the capability to focus and sit down for a day and imagine and vision, you know, next month I will uh, not only go to Copenhagen, but I will visit a friend at between Berlin and Hamburg is Wir bauen Zukunft. And it's, you should Google it, Wir bauen Zukunft. It's a fabulous space. And, and there you can just go there for a day and stopping the multitasking, all these emails and, and imagine your future and, Take time for take your time for the future and take take a day in the year. That's maybe enough or two, and maybe you should also take some good friends with you. You can invite Mark, you can invite Niels, and then you can have a, a day in the future. And uh, always do the plus ten years. That's that's easy. It's 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 far ahead, but it's also realistic. And always always do let's let's do it. I would recommend to do. One day a year, a day in the year 2030, 2031, 2032, and so on. And with, with, with good, good inspirational friends like Mark and um, yeah, take, take the time for vision. That's great. Yeah, we're, we will be in Copenhagen uh, um, yeah. very soon for La Futura. And Wir bauen der Zukunft is actually we're building the future. And um, I, I totally agree with that. If if you can't, as an, as an entrepreneur, as an executive, as a business owner, as a, a family man, as, as a, uh, um, a, a, a single person, as just a human being, if you can envision and clearly see in your mind what December 2030 will look and feel like and, and, and how it will be when you get there, um, there's a problem because right now on, on TV and on our media and that what we see is all very dystopian views of the future. And so if we don't have a clear view of what that future feels and looks or even try to imagine and create what it will be like, we're never gonna reach it. Well, the only images, the only information we have is it's all cyborgs and robots and dystopian we're fighting over uh, resources and water and whatever um well that narrative that story that vision will come true mm -hmm. if we don't have a better beautiful vision of what yeah. the future will be like and so uh, um the best way to do that is exactly how you said take time for yourself every year um to actually put yourself into the future and think about it speak with futurists and leaders and creators who are also thinking about it and try to create your version. You don't have to accept anybody else's version, create your version of what that, um, what that future looks like and then start working towards it. Usually if you have that vision and if you spend the yeah. time to do that, it's, it's, it's funny how you start working towards yes. that. In the beginning of our call, you were talking about greenwashing. The, the most crazy effect about greenwashing is those who, who practice greenwashing, if they did it long enough, they eventually switch to the real thing because yes. they realized it was a better model anyway. Yes. And they're like, we're, hell, we're just greenwashing, but this is such a good model and we're getting so much resonance and people are excited. We're going to go that way anyway. And so yes. they eventually switched and changed anyway because it's just a better more resilient model. And that leads me with my last question for you, and then I'll let you go. I know you've stayed later for, to, to speak with me. Um, and, and that ties nicely to this, this uh, what we just discussed about this vision of the future. It's similar to the burning question, but it's a little bit different. What does a world 
that works for everyone look like for you? Truly, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Describe it to us or, or, or let us know because I, I know you've done these workshops, these things before. So give us that vision. Can I say just one word? Sure. Collective intelligence. Yeah. Connecting our brains. Yeah, yeah. And because at the moment we are just like single intelligence units. And there are maybe some AI intelligence separately. But, but when we connect this intelligence on a global scale and we, we learn how to better connect our brains together, and th then it will be such an exponential growth of intelligence. And yeah, it's, almost a, it's almost a few more words because it's connected collective intelligence. You know, I, I think... I've had discussions with this. I'm going to be speaking to Chris Boos on the show pretty soon as well. He does a lot for AI and for Angelica Miracle and the Bundestag. But um, what we really need is a real-time update of collective intelligence for human beings. We need to have it so that we don't make the same mistakes we made in the past, but also so that we can get rid of all the, the fake news, the misinformation, the things that we just don't need to know to help us realize and make our lives a little bit easier of that vision of where the future is that we're going on. And that it's whether it's updated every hour or once a day, we get this real time update of, of collective intelligence that somehow says, okay, no, you know, we're on this clear path and we're moving to a much better future than this one where we're continuing to repeat mistakes over and over again um, that are getting us nowhere, you know, I mean, uh, the Trumpocalypses, the Putins, the Shays, the Bolsonaros, these civilization frameworks, they're not anything new. We've experienced them over centuries and decades before. We have more than 12 civilization frameworks in our world that have all collapsed, that don't exist anymore. Early antiquity, Mesopotamia, uh, the Greeks, the Romans, on and on. And those are civilizations that failed. Well, what kind of learnings can we use from those? Um, just because we have computers and innovation doesn't mean that we could avoid a collapse. Let's create those better futures. Let's learn from that. So I, I thank you for that. Uh, I, 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 I have to, I don't know if you will, you like this, but I have to add a, um, you know, a connected, co co a collective intelligence, something that's updated every day in real time or, or to some extent to give us that that little extra help that we need to get us into the futures those resilient desirable futures Niels, it's been absolutely fabulous and i can't wait to see you at la futura and um it's so ex i'm so glad you were on the show is there any last uh, words of wisdom you'd like to give my listeners it was so wonderful talking to you mark thank you very much very I, I enjoyed every moment and every second uh, being with you here. Also, that we can connect like from eye to eye, like remotely here. I, I love it. I love the session. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And also, let's connect with, with the people out there watching this. And we are really open to connect. And um, I'm so happy about on our every contact uh, interested in front end foresight future sustainable futures and all this topic so please get in touch with us mark and me and uh, maybe see you at la futura in uh, copenhagen on 16 17 september where uh, mark and i will be that that's great perfect i'll put the links of trend one and la futura on, yeah. on the show notes and and we'll publish it before and we'll promote it so thank you very much and We'll see you very soon. Thanks so much, Nils. Bye-bye, Mark. <laughs> Take care, brother.